Ah. Hello, readers. I'm Charity, the host of Booktrivert Reader Podcast, and I'm with another exciting uh, interview today with the Booktrivert Reader community. I've been following Jackie Pryor. I have been fascinated Perfect. with audiobook narrators, and I have been coming across Jackie Pryor on TikTok. And I love the fact that she has been narrating mainly fantasy romance, and I decided to invite her on onto my podcast to talk about my, her, the process of narrating, and all the fun stuff that I'm just very, very curious about. She even narrated titles such as House and Bane and Blood and Stars Are Dying and The Sky of Thorns. Jackie, definitely introduce yourself and tell me more about you. Sure. Hi, my name is Jackie. Although a lot of people who've been following me for a while know that I used to record under a different name. And so I know there's been confusion there. So I have titles under the name Nikki Pryor as well. Jackie is my legal first name. And at the end of this last year, I made the decision to make that switch. So that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, I started narrating about two and a half years ago. I originally started out narrating young adult titles under a different pseudonym. And then about a year and a half into my career, I started gravitating towards books that I enjoyed reading as a reader, which is, of course, romanticy and darker romanticy. <laughs> and so I've been just loving that I've, I feel like as I've, connected more with those authors just organically as a reader and as a fan of their books and have really started getting more projects in that realm. And I couldn't be happier because it's definitely where I want to be in the audiobook world. So I, I was new to spicier books when I became an audiobook <laughs> narrator. I still love young adult everything. Anyways, that was just a, a side of the book world that I hadn't had as much exposure to. As I got more involved on Book Talk and Bookstagram, I started seeing these titles and they just, yeah, I was very intrigued by them and started reading more in my own time and started going after those projects. But I knew early on I wanted to, even though I'm pretty public about my separation in pseudonyms for uh, YA projects versus new adult and adult fantasy. I wanted to have that distinction on Audible catalog and things like that because I am a mom. My daughter's in middle school, and she doesn't need to be embarrassed by that quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, because sometimes as a reader, especially when you're starting to get into the spicy stuff of fantasy, mm -hmm. it's a little awkward. How did you transition to from YA to romanticy concerning the spicy scenes and being able to narrate and talk about that? Just really gradually, I worked on some projects that would be half a chili pepper or one chili pepper. <laughs> half a and... chili pepper. <laughs> <laughs> that's, an, that's an acceptable rating. I think for your listeners, they'll, they'll get it. And uh, my comfort level just grew with it as I think as a person, I grew more comfortable with it. And I think that books helped me with that you had a I don't want to get too far into it but I had a really conservative upbringing mm -hmm. and so just being more comfortable with spice in general and recognizing hey it's not dirty it's not something that's taboo to talk about the book community really creates a space for that for people to be more open and uh, honest about the human experience and so I definitely I feel like I experienced that as a reader and narrator on that journey. Have you ever, in like, especially since you do dark fantasy romances, have you ever cut a limit where you're like, oh, that's a little much? Only, I've only turned down one project for that. I, I won't name the project, but the limit I hit, it was just, it, it was like, and it was very important to the character's backstory. I just, when you narrate a character, even a minor character, when you're creating their voices and you're putting yourself in that headspace, there was a very brief scene of uh, an incestual relationship between a child and his mother. Mm. And I, and it was not, it was like tastefully done. And again, so important because it was this origin story for this horrible villain. And I, 
completely understand the author's choices. It just, it was this such a dark place. I didn't want to go there as a performer. So mm. I, with all the love and respect for that author, declined. And uh, she found another amazing female narrator to, uh, to co-narrate that book. And very happy for her. Her career is doing great. So with that said, like you said about creating the narr- for the characters, how do you prepare for multiple narrations of, of characters? Because sometimes you have multiple POVs or male, female voices, even children. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you prepare for that? So one of the questions I always get asked is, do I read the book ahead of time? And the answer is always yes. And that's the number one thing you can do. And then... As I'm going through and I'm prepping my manuscript, each character gets assigned. I I choose a color and then consistently throughout the manuscript, they get that same color all throughout. And maybe it sounds silly, but I choose a color for them that means that feels like them. Mm. And just to set the tone when I'm doing my pre-read and getting to know them. And then when I'm in the booth, I don't do this for every book, but for authors who want to pre-approve voices before we start recording, I'll go through and I'll choose excerpts of each character's dialogue and basically propose a voice to the author. And then the author gets to say yes or no. And we might go back to the drawing board with some and some authors will send me like YouTube video clips or say, oh, you know, to me, this character feels like this character from this movie or TV show. And so I try to combine my experience with the character from reading, from reading about them or reading through their eyes with the author's intention for them and hope that it comes out okay. But as far as me as a performer, when I'm making those in- initial decisions, Some of the best advice I ever got, just about acting in general, but voice acting is you need to find where you and the character intersect and you need to understand where you and the character are different. And I guess just focus on those things. And then just like authors, when they're writing a character, need to think about what is this character's motivation? A narrator needs to do the same thing. Think about what is their motivation? I will ask authors for spoilers, <laughs> and they're yeah. they're usually not just me wanting to know. <laughs> they are usually relevant to how I'll voice a character, or I'll need to know if a character that's a minor character, say in book one, but they get a bigger role in book two, I'll need to know that as I'm choosing their voice, make sure I choose something that's sustainable <laughs> when they start talking more. Maybe I'm rambling a little bit, but... No, that's fine. <laughs> It sounds like a lot, but I feel like it it all happens very organically just as I'm prepping the manuscript. I'm very much that that reader that now that I have Instagram, I get to send messages to the author as well I'm reading. <laughs> I'm I don't know, it's just like my childhood dream come true. Oh, I just finished this book and I can actually tell the author how much I loved it. It's beyond cool. <laughs> I'd like that because the way you said it's happened organically or you need to ask for the worst thing ever is spoilers you know, to get a good sense of your character. And I love how you said the longevity of the character because you don't know if that side character would become the major role, like you said. And mm-hmm. I think that's a good way to prepare for these characters and give them life instead of just like, narrating, uh, which brings me into a very good hot topic is the Amazon AI narrating <sighs> and the thing about AI is that they don't have that same level of commitment obviously they don't have no. that oh let me let me organically try to find out who these people are they just blah 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 <laughs> so uh tell me about about that uh, your experience so far with that coming into play now so I, uh, there are some narrators on TikTok who've done a really good job of shining a light on that. And that's not as much how I use my platform, although I try to share my personal experience with it, just chatting with authors. It's, I've had very few authors tell me that it's something they would ever consider. 
I think what makes it attractive to some authors, I've heard through the grapevine that there are a lot of people interested in it. And the reasons they are, are for it's, in, it's less expensive. Their audiobook gets done quicker. They don't have to wait for the narrator they want for their schedule to open up. And they have control over production for the most part. They're not going to have as much of a proofing process. It's it's a quicker start to finish process overall. And so I do understand that. And especially when you combine that with the price point, I get it. That being said, I have a really hard time believing that those audiobooks will sell very well. And even though they're less expensive, I don't know if those authors will ever make what they sent back. But I guess I'm not too afraid of it right now. And I would have to say that a lot of that, I guess, optimistic perspective comes from from being really active on social media in the author communities and in the reader communities. And I feel like it's not what readers or authors really want if they if they were to choose one over the other. I think that readers, especially audiobook listeners, appreciate the performance that feels connected to the characters and to the story. And I I think that there's even it's even fair to say that a lot of audiobook listeners have favorite narrators and there's a fan base for audiobook narrators, especially some of these really gigantic names. I don't know, but I, I think that human connection, I'm not the most articulate person. Seriously, there's some people who've done this so well. It, it's not human. It's not going to care about your story. It's not going to cry when a beloved character dies. It's not going to communicate that glow up when a character steps into their power and takes their moment. It's not going to communicate a love story and the passion between two characters because it's never experienced any of those things. And I think, I know for myself, I put a lot of my own history into the, the characters that I connect with and AI just will never be able to do that. I don't know. Human voices only. <laughs> Hurrah! <laughs> um, I think AI has um, applications that are helpful and useful. It's just not for storytelling. I agree. And it's just, it is a little concerning that it's replacing quite a bit of humans, per se. It, can, yeah. it does have its uses, helpfulness. I won't lie that I do, sometimes use it, but I think there is a point where I'm like, oh, we need to draw the line a little bit. I know it's regardless, people are going to choose it, but I guess we'll see. I, I think ultimately, you know, Amazon, and I, I think Apple Books has done it too, but they saw the audiobook industry is one of the fastest growing sub industries of the, publish, of the overall publishing industry. And there's a lot of money to be made there, and they saw that. And authors who have their books narrated by AI can't even own the rights to their audiobooks because it's AI generated content. Uh, so they they'll forever be sharing that with Amazon. They can't give out free copies of their books. They can just give out promo codes for their books, but they don't have that ownership over their over their story. So Oh, I did yeah. not know that. So you get it faster, mm. but you lose the rights to it. Exactly. I think that's true across other platforms as well. Someone who has art generated just because they typed in the, the key words to have art generated, that doesn't make them the owner of that art. Mm -hmm. It's scary, but I think that the book community is more vibrant than ever and that mm -hmm. they're passionate about human storytellers, both authors and narrators, because oh, I saw... A few months ago, I saw this award. Someone, I feel like it was, I don't want to get it wrong, but there was a literary contest, not in the United States, where an AI-generated story was entered, and it wasn't disclosed, and they won. <gasps> yes. It was like a sci-fi story about AI. And um, it came out later that it was AI-generated, and they were disqualified. But it's it's not just narrators and artists. It's authors. So to me, I feel like, why would you pay into a program that's aiming to replace you as well? I know that's a concern for 
for writers is AI generated books. Mm -hmm. Big name author were to create an AI generated book and people didn't know and they were to just start cranking out books at a rapid pace like that. It would, I don't know, there's, there's ramifications that are bad for lack of a better way of putting it fun stuff fun stuff (laughs) yeah so i've been following you for some time and i know a challenge for you could be your health because you are uh you shared with the community about your autoimmune disorder and things like that and does that interfere with your work question so it depends. So I have good days and I have bad days. I would say in general, my autoimmune disorder, the biggest way it impacts my ability to work is just with fatigue because Mm -hmm. I don't want to narrate while I'm feeling really tired because that will absolutely come through in the audio. Right. I would have to say, on the other hand, you know, main symptoms are joint pain, hair loss. I'm actually wearing a hair topper right now because I have really significant hair loss at the moment. Those things get in the way of me sitting in a comfortable chair and speaking into a microphone. So audiobook narration has given me the opportunity to almost full time doing something I love. Even if my whole body is physically incapacitated, I can still always speak. The only things that ever come up, depending on the day, would be if I'm having like some cognitive issues, but that's fairly rare. I'm just too tired to do a good job. For the most part, no. The only side thing is because my immune system is weakened right now while I'm in treatment, I catch all these colds and that Mm. (laughs) more than anything, but... Um, you know, things I do, like I use Breathe Right strips to open up my nasal <laughs> passageways um, in the booth. Uh, I can get work done. Tea, lots of water, you know, showers, just anything I can do to make sure I don't sound congested in the microphone. Mm. But as long as I'm not congested, I'm good to go. How do you prepare going into each recording? Do you have like a system to warm up your voice tell me about how you do that my warm-up routine is one of the is lacking i'm pretty busy and i'm you know i'm always running from point a to point b and i'm using my voice really regularly throughout the day Uh, so for me it's more like coming into the booth is like these stolen moments where i'm like oh yes i finally get to be here and it's almost like self-care you know, come in, I have my big cup of hot tea, you know, at, at most I'll sit there for a moment and I might do some humming from my lower register to my higher register, make sure that I'm, uh, I'm when I'm narrating, I'm using just like a singer, you want to sing from your abdomen, not from up here, unless it's for a specific character. You want to make sure that that's what's being engaged is your diaphragm. And so I will do, I'll sit there and I'll hum and I'll drink my tea. And honestly, then I'll jump right in after doing that for a little bit. Not going from not using my voice at all to suddenly using it. I've been running around. And then this here in the booth is my is my moment to do what I'm excited to sit down and do. And it's, I don't know, that's not the correct answer if you ask any <laughs> other audiobook narrator, but that's that's what's honest for me right now well it's there's no wrong answer so <laughs> no there there is you're supposed to do vocal warm-ups and you know get like these draws and do like these like activities and the truth is i don't i don't do that and i i probably <laughs> should <laughs> i'm not right now i just i do the humming and i have the tea and it's just i go in and i make sure i'm relaxed and hit the ground running so because i don't know do you avoid roller coasters, exciting rides, so you don't overuse your voice on accident? Avoid those things, but not because I'm trying to. <laughs> my because voice. it's not fun. <laughs> it's not fun for me. I'm a I'm a total chicken. I am not a <laughs> I'm not a thrill seeker. <laughs> Any way, shape, or form. Uh, but no, it is something to like. You know, to go to a concert, I'm not going to scream at the top of my lungs. So that's maybe yeah. a better example. I love music. <laughs> or cheer for my daughter too loudly when she's on a sports team. Or So those things, 
do get taken into account. Yeah. <laughs> Forgot about concerts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, back. Concerts are back. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay. So do you have any specific uh, fantasy book or series that you like to, to narrate that stand out to you the most? That I have narrated or that I would like to? Uh, question is that you have done. The answer is yes. I don't like to publicly talk about any favorites because <laughs> something that I've really developed with my own personal business and branding is I'm very much about helping to promote the authors that I work with. I'm able to do that more with certain projects just based on what's going on in my personal life. But when I have an audiobook release, there's always going to be a post about it on multiple platforms. And I will, if I'm allowed, always will share snippets during the process unless it's for a company or a publisher. To me, that's a really big part of what I try to do for authors i don't like to i don't like to talk about uh favorites in general we'll say a couple of standout characters i've gotten to work on that have been pretty cool so far i've only done one character that also deals with chronic illness Mm. that was cool for of shadow and moonlight by luna laurier which we're actually re-recording that audiobook this spring lost our the male narrator on the project needed to step away because of uh, triggers that had come up that weren't triggers for him at the beginning of the series. So we're going to be re-recording, hopefully, Kickstarter goes well, with Anthony Palmini, who is the voice of Resand, a male love interest for that book. It was neat seeing a character and getting to do a couple of doctor's office scenes and checkups and just things that were familiar to me and some thoughts that went through that have gone through my head i would really love to do more books with characters that have chronic health issues but just seeing that be consistent and not get lost from the story Mm -hmm. because sometimes that happens where it's introduced but then she still goes on to you know world save the world and you never think about her joints ever again i loved that it wasn't lost in the shuffle of fourth grade. Mm-hmm. That was very cool. So kind of you mentioned earlier was working with other narrators. Is there, and you're having to record it, re-record it. Do you guys record at the same time? Or how does that work when you're recording with somebody else? Typically, no. Um, I Every once in a while, actually something I've only done once, we would get together for chapters where there was a lot of back and forth. And I would have my recording software open on my computer and we'd be on Discord. And then he did the same thing. And so we did it just so that we could respond to each other better. When you're recording separately, the way it works is say it's a chapter from the female point of view. Mm -hmm. Then the male the male narrator is just gonna sit there in his booth on his own (laughs) and record each individual line give it a couple seconds of space, next line. And it takes a little bit more effort to be really connected as you're just recording dialogue, not in the context of the story. In the past, when we've collaborated on Discord, it's been so that whoever's doing the dialogue can feel connected to the story and respond to how I voice something or how me respond to how he would voice something so that it feels more natural in the listening experience. But I've only done that one time. It can be pretty tricky to coordinate. I feel like I work with a lot of authors and male narrators who are on the East Coast. (laughs) And (laughs) so just that time difference can cause issues in finding a time that works for everyone. So alternative to that is I... We share a workspace. We'll upload our audio to Dropbox. So we can go in and listen to what the other person has done, kind of feel for the tone of that chapter, then just hope for the best. I feel like the more I work with um, my own narrator and them, and them for me, vice versa, we get a feel for how each other narrates different characters and get more familiar with each other's. And so it becomes less necessary the more we've worked together. I was kind of wondered how that happens when there's another dare reader in the process. Mm -hmm. It, it sounds like it, you know, a little bit of coordinating on it. (laughs) 
Yeah. What are some specific fantasies, some genres, or themes that you particularly enjoy narrating? Okay, so you mentioned Alexis's book earlier, House of Bane and Blood. I didn't realize how much I loved The Marriage of Convenience until I narrated that book. <laughs> and when I read her book, I was like, wow, I need more things like this. Her book got me excited about that trope in a way I hadn't been before because it was just done so well. Again, I hadn't, I don't think I had narrated anything with that trope and her book got me excited about it. Also, I'm a big fan of trials. So you mentioned uh, in Miranda's book, The Stars Are Dying, and there are trials in that book. Miranda Lynn's book, The Unmarked Witch, has trials. And there's something about the way having um, a series of trials progresses the storyline that I just, it just makes you root for the character. So I like, I like seeing that. Of course... I, I like enemies to lovers and morally lo you know of interest as much as the next <laughs> bookish person. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's a moment where you know you came. I like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So those are a few. <laughs> Do you have one that you specifically you're like? This is my least favorite. I could I could do it, but my least favorite. Yes, but I won't say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you strike a balance between keeping the listeners engaged and maintaining the author's original intent in the fantasy story? I think um, I am engaged when I'm telling the story, and that's just something I can physically feel. You know, when you're reading out loud, you can feel the difference between being in autopilot and just reading the words on the page and being invested. And uh, for me, when I'm marking up my manuscript, because I use my iPad and I have this amazing app called I Annotate, where I can write all over the PDF, I try to circle words as I'm reading where I'm like, that is something I want to lean into, whether it's the overall feeling of the sentence or the page or whatever. And I try to, as I'm reading as a reader and I'm like feeling myself getting into the story, I try to look for those moments when I'm prepping. Um, so then when I'm in the booth, I have that reminder. Although I almost don't even need it because when I'm doing that read through and I have my fully prepped manuscript, I feel like it's then that I'm reading out loud that I get to enjoy the story as a reader. When I was less busy, I used to do a pre-read of the story where I wouldn't mark up the manuscript at all. I would just do my reader read. And then I would mark up the manuscript and then I would narrate it. And now I don't have time for that reader's read. So my time in the booth has become that time where I don't have to sit and think about the character voices because they've already been picked. I don't have to mark up my script. I just get to be there and enjoy it as a reader. And I love reading out loud. I think, yeah, I'm engaged. I hope that that translates. But again, there there are things you can do. I think having a variety of character voices, making sure that the characters don't sound too similar so that the listener doesn't get confused about who's speaking. Mm -hmm. um, that helps. Making sure that the way I'm reading a sentence matches the way it's being described so that it doesn't take the the listener out of the story. Like people tell me when they talk to me in person or um, the times I've met people in person is I'm a pretty upbeat person. I'm pretty optimistic and I narrate some really dark stuff. It feels <laughs> like a massive contradiction and maybe it is, but I just like exploring those themes. It's very fun for me. But So I, I'm assuming that if an author reaches out to you, say, hey, I would like you to narrate my book. You you do request the book and you kind of decide from there if you would like to proceed after you read it. Am I correct? Uh, no, I don't read the book before I accept it. Okay. We'll, um, when I'll, I'll look up the book. I'll look up their social media pages if I don't already follow them. Go and check out what people are saying on Goodreads with a grain of salt because I know that people can be brutal over there. Mm -hmm. I'll check out Amazon re reviews and just because occasionally if there is something that is problematic with a book, that's something I want to avoid. And 
if I look on Goodreads, if there is anything potentially problematic, it's going to be loud and clear over there. I'll, I'll do that. And if everything's looking good, the next step when an author reaches out is I'll say, hey, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely interested. I'll ask them if they would like to send me a scene to, to record for them as an audition. And so then they'll pick a scene and I'll record it and, and send it to them and we'll we'll go from there. But do judge books by their covers. <laughs> I like having a catalog with, you know, I, I want pretty book covers to be associated with my name. <laughs> and then, yeah, I'll get a feel for the book. Authors are usually great about sharing upfront any content or trigger warnings. If they don't, I'll ask. And I'll narrate most anything. So for me, that's usually all I need. In your opinion, what makes a very compelling fantasy audiobook listening experience? I need to like the voice of the narrator. <laughs> <laughs> so, hmm. Um, it's, it's a combination of things. I think that a good narrator can take uh, an okay story and enhance it. Just... I feel like technically a narrator can do things with their inflection and their pacing to keep the listener engaged, but I don't know what it is that makes a book draw you in and make you addicted to it. I just know that I love it when it happens to me. <laughs> I don't know. I just like being swept away and uh, that moment where you don't want to do anything else and you keep cleaning your house or you drive an extra lap around the block so that you keep going but I think it's just this beautiful magical combination of the right narrator and a fantastic story and when those two come together it's just it is pure magic and so I don't know all the the right ingredients but it's magical when it happens <laughs> Well, it definitely, you know, your personality goes right into the audio narration, and that's so important. And just to wrap up the interview, tell our listeners where to find you, some new projects that you set, you mentioned to me that you wanted to announce. And sure. All that. Um, so I am on TikTok and Instagram. Uh, I think my handle is Jackie, J-A-C-C-I, prior narrator nice and boring easy to find <laughs> and the best place to uh, stay up to date about what i'm working on is just to peek at my website uh, because with the with i have titles transitioning uh from old names to new names the most comprehensive place to see what i've worked on is at my website so for new adult and adult titles that is jackieprior.com if you uh are you know interested in new adult books and kind of just more of a variety of other genres. That would be, I switched to Jacqueline James, J-A-C-C-L-Y-N, James.com. So those are two places where you can view my work, reach out to me. So I don't have a newsletter because I don't have the time for that. But I'm <laughs> usually pretty good at responding to emails and things like that. I I lurk a lot in the Instagram DMs of authors and things. So... That's yeah, a good way to connect. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I I'm not kidding. I I am a hundred percent that reader where I'm like, no, you killed them or uh <laughs> so when uh, are you gonna get your second book out? Thank you very much. <laughs> or I'll I'll you know message I'm like, by the way, I cried. <laughs> so the project I, I got permission to announce literally five minutes before this and Again, it's not too big of a surprise, but I am the official female narrator for Till Death by Miranda Lynn. Mm -hmm. I just put it on my website because um, she let me do the voiceover for her book trailer. And um, I am of 100 pages left to read before I'm done with it and can start working on it. It is going to be duet narration. I don't have permission to announce the male narrator. All I can say is everyone is going to be very happy with him and it's a project i'm ridiculously excited for i uh, it's so cool it's a standalone fantasy book big book uh, i think it's like 600 plus pages oh. it's gonna it's gonna be one you can sink your teeth into and just like i think you'd be addicted to it so very excited for that one and i know we're supposed to wrap it up 
But I have that one <laughs> last question. I promise yes. you. No. It, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about this, you know, because a 600 page book, I, I've come across those. Those can be like 15 hours after the final product. How long mm -hmm. will it take for you to narrate? And do mm. you do your own editing when it comes to that kinds of stuff? I occasionally um, I'll edit audiobooks. Okay, so let us do the math. Okay, um, so let's say 600 pages. I believe it's around 180,000 words. I narrate about 9,000 words per hour. So her audiobook will probably be around 20 hours long. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, 20 hours long finished product let's say it takes me two hours to record one hour so that's 40 hours or that's 80 hours right there and then of course there's the reading it shoot anyways <laughs> it's a lot of hours math is not my thing <laughs> but in general it takes me about an hour uh, two hours to record one hour that's my ratio okay Okay. So, so at least this one, I love duet narration. Um, I only have to voice the the female or femme characters, and then narrate the story. I feel like I'm pretty good at male voices, but it's always nice when I'm doing duet, and then I don't have to worry about coming up with half the voices for the story. I enjoy that. Um, it also lets me use more parts of my vocal register for female characters when normally I would have to reserve those for men, but it, I don't know. That's, <laughs> again, rambling. Here's my comfort drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I think it's a good insight of what you do and the, good. I wouldn't say blood, sweat, and tears. I wouldn't say that, but just the passion that goes into narrating books that a lot of people don't get to see very often. They enjoy the final product, but they don't see the effort that goes into Definitely. producing it. So, so I'm hoping with this episode, people are going to get to see that it's not just talking into a microphone. It's a lot of work and a lot of passion into it. To so put all the links below to find Jackie over on TikTok, Instagram, and her Thank website you. and everything. She uh, definitely follow because she does give a lot more background and some snippets of books that she's doing. So I've been following for a while and I enjoy those. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, thank you for joining Jackie and your insight and catch thank you, you later. Thank you for having years. me. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. <laughs>